Good morning and happy Sabbath. How are each of you today? It is a much smaller and quieter church because it's home leave here at Monterey Bay Academy, but it's okay to have calm and quiet, a um, little, little rest. And with teaching this year, I'm, I'm realizing I'm, even though I'm still working on my other job, oh, the last few days felt more normal. And uh, so that was nice. And the break, we love the children, but a break is good. <laughs> Break is good, and it is a beautiful day outside. Oh my goodness. Um, over the hill, it's supposed to be 90, so I'm definitely appreciating the 70 degrees here, which will be beautiful and wonderful. So just welcome to church this morning, and we're excited to welcome to our pulpit Pastor Sam Smith, who is the Watsonville Church Pastor, so we're uh, appreciative to get to have him today joining us. And we're gonna begin with a mission spotlight brought to us from Tokyo. Cities throughout Northern Asia, like Seoul, Taipei, Tokyo, and Ulaanbaatar, are home to millions of people who have not heard the gospel message. Reaching these vast cities seems daunting, and the work in sensitive territories is even more difficult to measure. Not even 1% of the 230 million people in the Northern Asia Pacific region are Seventh-day Adventists. Despite the challenges, Adventists pray for opportunities to share the light of Jesus in this territory. The Adventist Church in Japan invited the General Conference and the Northern Asia Pacific Division to partner with them to create Mission Unusual, a massive church planting and disciple making movement. Since Tokyo is the world's largest city, this movement is an ambitious effort. Working closely with local Japanese church leaders, a team of church planting missionaries is on the ground, learning the language and deciding how best to share Jesus with the Japanese. The three missionary couples spend hours each day preparing themselves for the work within central Tokyo. It's not just the population size that makes outreach hard. There are many barriers to religion too. The Japanese society is largely secular and many people adhere to Eastern philosophy. Another challenge is overcoming the isolation of the older generation. Reaching out to them and showing them compassion can be tricky. Missionaries like Yuri and Laïs have been creating connections with their neighbors. Simple tasks like shopping, visiting the local park, and practicing their growing Japanese vocabulary with strangers on the street are all opportunities to connect. The missionary team gathers each Sabbath to pray, study God's word, eat, laugh, share challenges, and seek the Holy Spirit together. Aya is a great example of a local church member who has taken the spirit of mission unusual to heart. She uses her home as a place of ministry, especially for parents and kids. Some have been introduced to the Bible for the first time in her living room. Others have even requested prayer for their families. Amazing things are happening in Tokyo. With time, the ministry team will grow as plans are made to bring in global mission pioneers, urban centers of influence, volunteers, and tent makers in the future. The challenge of ministering to the world's largest city can sometimes seem like too much but God's power can overcome all barriers. We ask that you continue to pray for the Mission Unusual Church Planting and Disciple Making Movement. Pray that the Adventists here will continue to develop new creative ways to build connections with those around them. Thank you for supporting the mission offering, which fuels work like this. incredible and wonderful that we have individuals that go to even the far lands as we have a mission field right here um, right next door but also far away and our offering today is for local church budget so the uh, basket will be at the back um, as you are leaving our scripture today is from Malachi 4 5 and 6 if you'd like to turn with me Malachi 4, 5, and 6. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. 
He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And I'm sure that Pastor Sam is going to give us a great message regarding uh, that verse. Let's bow our heads for prayer at this time. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today and thank you for the sun that is shining and the opportunity that we have to come together and to worship with one another. Because of you, as you have promised us where two or three are gathered, you are there also. And so, Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts to the message that Pastor Sam has for us today. May you speak through him, and may it be words that, we, that our ears need to hear. We ask for continued guidance and blessing over Monterey Bay Academy, and for all of our students and parents and our staff, and we ask for continued health um, and wellness as we move through the coming months. Be with us now, and thank you for your um, unconditional love for us each day. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we will have some music. Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. I would think this would be one of those. Praise him in the firm of his power. Speaking of the atmosphere and air. Praise him uh, for his excellent greatness. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Sorry. Um, I left off praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Um, I think that's uh, important. I think Mrs. Enke would agree with that. Praise him uh, with the uh, sound of psaltery and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbal. Praise him upon the, sorry, praise him upon the loud cymbal. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbal. And this part, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So, somewhere in there, we have the stringed instruments, right? And we have let everything that hath breath. That's you and me. So, to that end, we're going to go through some hymns that I think will lift up and bring us to the point of realizing that God is the answer we need um, in life, whether it's today or tomorrow or the next day or the future. They're going to be hymns, but the music will, the words will be up there as well. Hymn 229 to start off with, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. to 547, um, a little more contemplated, but I, I just really, really like this song of Celtic origins.
I was playing that last line. I'm sorry, I'm going to do that. I know it should never stop, but man, that just drove, drove me nuts. Sorry, was blind. I'm not going to ruin the line from scripture that it actually inspired me. Sorry. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my Yeah. 
Good morning, Monterey Bay Academy Church. It's good to see everyone. This is the first time I'm worshiping with this congregation. It's so nice to be with you all, and uh, it's so good to see you guys. This morning, I'm going to be sharing a message that is not mine. This is something that I heard that was the most impactful message I've ever heard in my life. Um, it's not the, maybe the most exciting in terms of passionate and David Ashtrick or Ivor Myers or if you like listening to someone who has a little bit more get up and go. Usually I like preaching that way, but this one is going to be in the style a little bit more of a, a seminar or a classroom rec lecture. I wish I knew what was in this presentation a long time ago. <laughs> When the family falls apart. Oh, that's right. I've got to turn it on. Where it says on, is that what I do? There we go. Okay. When the family falls apart. This is originally titled Family and the Cycle of Dysfunction. Doesn't that sound exciting and encouraging? It's along with that wonderful text, Donna, that you read. Thank you so much. Excellent reading. Let's go ahead and pray and jump into this. Father, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful community here at Monterey Bay Academy Church. Father, we want to pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to do a work of healing. Father, we know that there are so many broken relationships with our lives. And Father, we want to pray that today you would be Dr. Jesus and that you would seek to take those broken incidences in our lives and that they would be transformed into those places where we can say this is the point where God shined the brightest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I was, and I know that, Donna, you said it's a relief to have a break from the kids. I believe that. I was wanting to share this with the kids as well, but I'm so happy that we're going to be sharing it in this format too. We're going to have a little bit of a Bible study. Family and the cycle of dysfunction. And now we're not working. Fun. What do you think of when you think of the term, oh, there we go. This presentation is a, a presentation, thank you so much. This is uh, originally from these two wonderful people, Drs. Bev David and Beverly Sablachik. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. David and Beverly Sablachik, they teach counseling at the seminary at Andrews. Um, I owe my life to these people. Um, I'll be honest, I'm an honest person. Sometimes it gets me into trouble. Uh, I, I was suicidal while I was at the seminary, oddly enough, and um, had a lot of good help with good godly Christian counselors, these two people. I owe them my life, and these are the people who shared this presentation with me. Pause for climactic effect. <laughs> There we go, the concept of family. Donna, did you do that? or Okay, I'm gonna point to you, thank you. So what, what's, what do you understand the concept of family to be? You know, it's very interesting. Last Sabbath at Watsonville, we talked about music. Some people are hymns only people. If it's not in the SDA hymnal, we better not sing it at church. Some people are the opposite, and they'll say, we are only praise music people. Some people, as, as we were talking with uh, some of the teachers at VHM, they were trying to share the music, the praise music from, from their time, and the kids are like, what is this? We want to listen to the praise music from our time. Still other people are more like, we don't care if it's in the hymnal. We don't care if it's a praise song. We don't want it at all. We only want scripture songs. I've met, have you met people, like, and maybe you're offended because I called you out this morning. I don't know. But uh, regardless, it's very clear that, that much of what we see in terms of the world and our perspectives and our definitions comes from our own experience. So when I say family, your perspective might be a wonderful picture 
a picture of Christmas time and Thanksgiving. It's right around the corner. You might be thinking about those experiences, going water skiing, or maybe just having a nice, simple picnic at a local park. For others of us, we might see brokenness. We might think of memories that we don't want to think of, but maybe some of us have even blocked memories out entirely. But the family is important. The family is important. It's, it's precious to God. But, but we see that there are, uh, is a dichotomy here with strong families and weak families. In strong families, we see these things. We see cohesion. In other words, individuality and mutuality. We're able to be um, ourselves as a person, but we also recognize that we have a responsibility in our family. Um, adaptability. I'm flexible, but I'm stable. Yes, I'm willing to you know, adjust to help you out, but no, I also have a stability. I'm not going to give up this dream to do that. I've got a boundary with you there. Communication. Clear perception, clear expression. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm thinking. I don't have to try to sugarcoat it or play games with you. And, and also, um, I, I can understand what you're sharing. Uh, role structure, we agree on roles. We have clear boundaries in terms of what we're supposed to be doing, and that comes from mutual discussion. So mom and dad know what, what they're doing in the family. The kids know what they're doing as well, but there's also good boundaries. It's not just one person saying, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. In weak families, we see enmeshment. People are so enmeshed, they're not able to make their own decisions. Oh my goodness, I couldn't possibly make that decision. I have no clue what would happen if, if you disagreed with me. Uh, where are we going to eat tonight, honey? I don't know. That might be a, a very simple uh, simple possible example of enmeshment. Uh, the other one is disengagement. I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to walk out on you. Um, the other one would be a, a, an adaptability instead of flexibility and stability, rigidity and chaos. One is you will do this. We sit in the same places every single mealtime. If someone were to change the mealtime, there would be an explosion. Uh, the other one would be absolute pandemonium and chaos. Everything's going around and there are no clear boundaries. Anyway, you folks can read. Unclear perception, unclear expression, conflict over roles, diffuse boundaries. These are examples of strong families and weak families. And why do we point that out? We only point that out because it's helpful for us to understand. Maybe we recognize our families in these scenarios. Uh, Donna, if we can get the next slide, that would be awesome. Sorry, this isn't working. Thank you. So we can see healthy relationships are based off of trust, vulnerability, communication, listening, appropriate boundaries for couples, for kids, for parents and in-laws. Um, no, honey, we need to talk before you invite your mom over again. That would be a good appropriate boundary. Healthy self-differentiation. I know who I am. I know who you are. Honesty, selflessness, other-centered commitment, love, intimacy, meeting others' needs, but not for the sake of my own gratification. I'm not going to do something loving for you because I get something out of that in return. That can be a byproduct, but the reason I love you is because I love you, not because I have an expectation to follow through after that. And then, of course, empowering others, compassion, forgiveness, and God. Those are healthy relationships. In Genesis chapter 3, we see where dysfunction enters the human condition. Genesis chapter 3, we see that sin is a separating agent, separation from each other. Um, it, it leads to brokenness perpetuated to the next generation. Selfishness at the core of fear. Bias of um, basis of all anger is fear. Did you know that? The basis of all anger is fear. If I'm feeling angry, a very good thing to do would be to say, what am I feeling afraid of right now? It could be a legitimate fear. It could be an illegitimate fear. Um, the blame game, base, uh, basis of all anger is fear, trauma. So we have the blame game. We want to protect 
ourselves from the uncomfortable experience. When we look at Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 2 describes the human dynamic as being naked and unashamed. That idea of shame is so prevalent in our culture. And I I just want to give a clear definition. Unfortunately, it's been the practice of Christianity, of pastors, of church leaders, of teachers, of parents, of everyone to use shame as a tool. Well, well, let's talk about what, what is shame, what is guilt? Well, let's start off with guilt. Because if I do something wrong, should I know that? Should I be aware of the fact I did something wrong? A- absolutely, I should be aware of something that I did wrong. Sh- guilt is the awareness that I have done a bad thing. Shame is when I now believe that because I did something bad, I am a bad person. You don't want to be like that person. Here's a common one that I heard growing up, and maybe you've heard it expressed as well. You're just like your father. Shame. Shame. And that one's particularly damaging because most boys want to look up to their fathers, And so you've taken a a role that that the son wants to be like, and you've made it a shameful thing. And you've also turned um, that son into being just like his father. You've shamed him. When we weaponize shame, when we talk about being this kind of person or that kind of person, I mean, friends, just look at the news. Look at the shame that's out there. Shame is not a godly thing. Guilt, yes, guilt is something that we must experience. Guilt is, I've done something wrong, I need to make it right. But once again, shame is, I am something wrong, and I need to hide, I need to cope, I need to stay away from other people. That's what shame is. And that's what we see in the situation with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They hide, and then they blame when they're discovered. Um, this is some, uh, and just to keep them company with Adam and Eve, Donna, you are on it, my friend. Thank you. Uh, we see that these are other dysfunctional relationships in the Bible, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, mercy, uh, Noah and his family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, it's interesting when you look at Abraham and Isaac, Abraham has two incidences where he says that Sarah's his sister to protect him from a monarch. He does it twice. Isaac does it too, because he learned from his father. Dysfunctional families. Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Eli and his sons, David, Absalom, Ahab, Jezebel, the Corinthian church. Even the disciples. Dysfunctional relationships, dysfunctional families in the Bible. I'm so grateful that the Bible was written about real people, aren't you? Sometimes we we make it up like David is this superhero, this this legend, and he could not do anything wrong. You know, when we read the biblical narratives, the biblical narratives are not telling us to be exactly like the people in the biblical narratives. Those people are examples, and sometimes they make good decisions, sometimes they make bad decisions. And so we must recognize, friends, that we have much company and that God has been working in the lives of people with dysfunctional relationships. One of the saddest stories in all of scripture, relating again to to sons and fathers, um, but certainly could be said of daughters and mothers as well, and many other relationships, is 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. This is when, when Samuel calls the sons of Jesse together because Saul has been found in this perpetual state of rebellion, where he has said, no God, not your way, but my way is the way that will be done. And so... Samuel is directed by God to seek out the sons of Jesse to find the new king. And all the sons are called, and most of us would probably know the story, the the tall and the handsome and the, the oldest sons are called first, and then you know, they're kind of passed over by the Lord and, and, and over and over and over again until finally Samuel says to Jesse, are the young men, are, are, are all the young men here? Are all of your children, all of your sons here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. Now, we'll stop right here because the Hebrew could be taken as the youngest, but there's also another way you could take it. There remains yet a worthless one. Oof. 
a worthless one. And there he is keeping the sheep. Scholars debate about this, but some believe that that David was actually the illegitimate son of Jesse, that he was not actually a legitimate son of Jesse. Like I said, there's debate. But um, we, we see that David was not held in much esteem by his father. Without raising your hands, how many of you had that experience with your parents? You know, my grandmother's name is Georgia. She was supposed to be George. A little thing. But when you talk with her about it, you can still know that there's pain in her heart because she wasn't who she was supposed to be, according to her parents. And and I know, friends, that there there are experiences like that in this room, that you have experiences where, whether it was a, a, a parent or a grandparent or a mentor, a teacher, a pastor, somebody has looked at you with contempt. But the good news from 1 Samuel is that God has called you regardless. That's the good news. The cycle of family dysfunction, though, is something that we must deal with. What's a cycle? Well, you know, if you were to ask uh, Jen, the biology teacher, she'd talk to you about all kinds of cycles, right? Uh, This is not one of those cycles. This is not the nitrogen cycle or or any cycle like that. This is the family system cycle. Um, A family system is the family dynamics that you have in your family. Could be healthy, could be unhealthy. In this case, if we're talking about an unhealthy family system, we can see that that will lead to addiction, which leads to love needs, which leads to rules of dysfunction, which leads to garbage can of the heart, which leads to self-structures to family system. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of our time together this morning. If you picture a happy, healthy family, what do you picture? Anybody want to be brave and say something, make it interactive. Kids, yeah, absolutely. There's two happy kids in that picture. Mom and dad who love each other, right, who love their kids. Stability, not looking for resources. Any other ideas of what constitutes a healthy family? There are a lot of them. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, So in a healthy marital relationship, um, we see this. Healthy marital relationships, desired qualities, honesty. Anybody want honesty in your relationship? That's kind of important. Loyalty, good communication, um, puts God first, hard worker, good listener. Somebody, when we were in the seminary, by the way, pastors are human. Somebody said, hot, hot. Um, (laughs) And that's something, you know, physical attractiveness, that's good. Musical share, uh, um, mutually sharing these qualities and meeting each other's and children's needs. You know, that's that's a healthy dynamic. And obviously not everyone's going to meet each other's love needs all the time. God is the only one who can do that. But this is a healthy dynamic. What happens when those things aren't there? We see addiction. We see a dysfunctional family system. We see that in this situation, the, the, uh, specifically in this situation, the husband, the father, has something that prevents him from loving the family. There's some problem going on in the family. Perhaps he has not dealt with childhood trauma from his own experience. Perhaps he has not dealt with something. Maybe he has severe pain that he doesn't know how to cope with. And so he he turns to other things for comfort, whether that's food, whether that's sex or work or alcohol or drugs or you name it, religion. He turns to these things that give him a sense of of, of um, numbness so that he doesn't have to feel that. But in doing so, he also does not give his partner, and by the way, these things are totally reversible, um, what they need. Love needs are not met. And so what happens is the spouse will turn to seek out their partner trying to love them, trying to pursue them. How many times have you seen or heard the story of abusive relationships where 
the abused partner continues to seek out the abusing partner over and over and over again. It's a, it's a very sad song that has been sung many times. And it's because those love needs aren't met, so I need to pour myself out to you so that, that you can feel loved, so you can start loving me. And that doesn't happen. And so the, the spouse chases after their spouse, whether they're successful or not. Sometimes if the spouse leaves, they don't particularly chase their spouse but they spend all of their time thinking about the love that was lost. That can happen as well. And so we can see that children's love needs are unmet in this type of a family system. You know, every child has seven love needs. These are not wants. These are not suggestions. If you want your children to be healthy and happy and, and successful people, they need these seven needs all the time. They need affection. They need affection. You know, I love seeing uh, Dean Grady just give love and affection to his family. He's just such an affectionate guy. Uh, I really appreciate seeing that, that affection and, and getting that, that love just poured out onto you. I love you so much. A, a second one is affirmation. Hey, you did a good job. Now, we want to be careful with this one. We don't want a child's sense of value coming from what they do. But, but we can encourage, we can say, that was an excellent flagpole. Or that was such hard work that you put into your class and you got this grade that you worked very hard for. That is exceptional. You can say things like that. What, what you want to avoid is you want to say, you are so, if, I had a, a youth kid like this one time in Sonora, and she was so traumatized by, by actually what we might call affirmation because her dad was constantly saying, you are so smart. You're just the smartest kid ever. Look at your grades. You're so smart. And, and what happened in this child's psyche was if I ever get a grade that is lower than my average, that affection is going to go away. My value is now tied to my grades. So we don't want to do that. But like I said, we can say you worked really hard on that. That's an exceptional grade that you got on that. Third one, attention. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we were recently watching uh, one of our, uh, she's kind of our adopted niece, and, and I got in trouble, and I'm, I'm not saying that sarcastically. I, I recognized there was a problem because she was watching this two-year-old while the parents were on a date, and um, as, I, as she was watching them, I was having a meeting. I was having a Zoom meeting. After the Zoom meeting, uh, I came in, um, to the house where they were, and Sarah was super great, gracious, and she made dinner, and I, it was my turn to watch the little girl, a and I turned on Thomas the Tank Engine and Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, because she loves those things, and it was great, and we just watched TV, and it was great. The kid was zoning out, I was zoning out, we were having a great time, a and Sarah came to me, and she said, are you going to do that when, when we have a kid? Because <laughs> I realized I was not giving her uh, attention. I wasn't giving this little two-year-old attention. We were zoning out together, uh, and, and that was something, not to say that we can't ever watch TV, but that was something that was a good heads up. Hey, kids need attention. Um, protection. Discipline. Now, this one is controversial. What is the root word of discipline? Disciple. And, and what's a disciple? D disciple's a student. A student is someone who learns. Punishment is punitive. Punishment is I'm doing this to you because you did this to me. This is reciprocity. This is you paying for your actions. Notice that's not, punishment is not on the list. Discipline is on the list. Discipline means giving kids boundaries, teaching them. Because the goal of a parent, and I remember uh, my, my old boss, Pastor Nathan Renner, he's not old, but previous boss, uh, he said this. He said, when, when my wife and I gave birth, uh, well, Becky gave birth. When Becky gave birth to Levi and Lolo, they actively began the process of trying to get rid of them. Did you know that's your job as parents? Now, you're not trying to get rid of them like, hey, we don't want to talk to you ever, but your job is to help that child. Uh, and, and, and educators, your job is to help these students to grow to be successful adults. 
That, that's the call of parenting. That's the call of, of disciple makers, is, is to help that growth process. Our job isn't to coddle, it's to nurture. And, and, and so there's that discipline factor that must be there. We must teach our kids how to be responsible adults. And yes, sometimes that means implementing things that are not pleasant, but it must be in the context of learning. It must not be in the context of, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. So that's a love need. Um, number six, comfort. Number seven, guidance. These are seven love needs that all kids need. Let's go to the next slide. So thank you. So when we see that these love needs are not meant, we fall into the rules of dysfunction because kids know that they need these things. Rules of dysfunction when love needs aren't met might look like these, and there are certainly more. Don't talk. Did you ever feel like that lesson was taught to you as a kid? Children are to be seen and not heard. Don't talk. Number two, don't trust. If mom and dad make a promise to me and they don't keep it because dad's addicted to something or mom's addicted to something, I can't trust other people. I must have extreme self-reliance. Don't feel. I can't have feelings because every th two weeks I go between mommy and daddy because we're divorced. Now, friends, I want to be very careful here because I know that all of us have dysfunctional relationships, and I know that some of us might have um, experienced divorce, and we might experience separation with family. And let's go back to the beginning. We're talking about guilt versus shame. Shame is not something that is the hope of this presentation at all but rather it's to communicate reality. So if anyone has that experience here this morning, I want you to know that you are loved, you are wanted, and there is hope. Um, but, but we need to know these things. We need to be aware that our actions have consequences on other people. Um, so, so if I am constantly rotating between mom and dad, or as there was a, a kid on TikTok recently whose dad recorded him and said, Tell everyone that you like mommy, or you like being with daddy more than mommy. That's extreme emotional abuse because you're asking this child uh, to humiliate themselves and their mother in front of other people and, and, and lie to please the parent. That's incredibly destructive behavior. Don't feel. Number four, be good. That's something we often hear in children's story, isn't it? All right, boys and girls, be good. Friends, as a, a Christians, we believe that the Holy Spirit can transform the heart, but, but we don't believe in the power of being good by ourselves. And, and, and so that temptation to be good um, means that we're not allowing kids to be honest, to think about why they're doing things. Rather than making decisions based off of principle, we're teaching kids to make decisions off of being good, this nebulous idea that can lead to a lot of shame when they're not good, when they don't make those good decisions. And then the fifth one is in the same vein, be perfect. These messages will hit your kids, hit our kids, hit, our, hit us, and when we hear these messages, we are in for it because we are not capable of meeting these things. We're never asked to meet these things. And so we lead to the next part, which is the garbage can of the heart. So this is a video. I'll talk quickly. There's a neglect that just went in the garbage can, and loneliness is going to go in the garbage can, and then hurt's going to go in the garbage can. And what happens when you put trash in the garbage and put the lid on it? I know you're all people from MBA, so it stays cold here. But in Modesto, where I grew up, it gets hot. And when the sun is out and the, the lid is on and the trash is in the trash can, you know what starts to happen in the valley? It starts to stink. It starts to decay. It starts to break down. And, and that's what happens when we communicate these messages about you shouldn't be like this, you shouldn't be like that. And the kid has all these emotions. They get baked in this pressure, cush pressure cooking garbage can. And you know what happens in that experience? Something's got to give, and that lid isn't going to stay on. And when it explodes off, it's going to stink. It's going to be ugly. So let's think about that. Have you ever experienced, have you ever seen that in a young person? 
an explosion of nastiness, of, of, of grotesque filth and stench, just had a kid just totally come at you. What are the circumstances behind that? Could it be that love needs aren't being met? Could it be that there is some major dysfunction going on in the home? Could it be that this kid is more than just trying to have it in for me, but this kid ha has some things that they need to get through? The garbage can of the human heart leads to negative feelings that build up inside and cannot be expressed or dealt with. Now, one thing we need to understand is that emotions, sometimes, have you ever heard the term, stop being so emotional? Have you ever heard someone say that to you? Stop being so emotional. What are emotions? You know, I was talking to some fifth and sixth graders um, two weeks ago about what emotions are. I said, what do you think about emotions? They're like, I hate them. Like, okay, yeah, like, I don't know what to do with these emotions. So what would life look like without emotions? They'd be like, well, I guess I'd be a robot. What are emotions? Well, friends, emotions are simply value judgments. If I'm driving in traffic and I get cut off, I feel angry. Why do I feel angry? Because my boundaries were just violated. This person came in too quickly and they could have caused a wreck or maybe my ego was hurt because I thought I was driving fast enough and they decided to, you know, cut me off and make a nasty gesture towards me. Uh, I'm, I, my, my values are angry, my values are violated and therefore I'm angry. What, what does happiness mean? It means that my values are experiencing growth and life. I'm, I'm happy. I see my family together at a surprise birthday party, if you like surprise birthday parties, and you see that all these people have come together and loved you to support you, to celebrate with you on your big day. That is, is, is happy because your values of feeling loved and validated as a person are, are, are expressed. And, and so that's what emotions really mean. So rather than just telling yourself, don't be so emotional, we should ask ourselves, what is this emotion communicating to me about my values? Now, my values aren't just right just because I value them. In our world today, we see an increasingly polarized world right now, right? And there are many differing um, conflicting values. One of the values that we see right now being conflicted a lot is freedom versus safety. And... Um, especially with COVID, we, we see that these values are, are in deep debate um, now more than ever. And, and there are a lot of polarizing perspectives out there. I have perspectives, you have perspectives. The point isn't COVID this morning, though. It's to point out that we're seeing a very emotional world because people are feeling like values are being um, violated left and right. So when a kid is having emotions of anger, of rage, of loneliness, of shame, um, guilt uh, can, you know, I use those two definitions, but guilt can certainly have a negative effect. False guilt, for instance, abandonment, fear, anxiety, feeling unlovable, feeling worthless, feeling betrayed, feeling sad, feeling frustrated, unprotected, unwanted, isolated, not good enough. These are the roots that will give birth to the fruits of dysfunction, of brokenness, of addiction, all over again. It leads to self-structures. And self-structures are things that we build so that we can cope with our pain. One is shame core. You know what? It sounds horrible. It is horrible. But you know what? I am the scum of the earth. I admit it. I'm the scum of the earth. I deserve everything that's happened to me. I'm such a bad person. Now, we hear that and we're like, oh, that's horrible. But, but can you see how that's actually helpful? Because it finally gives my, play, my brain a place to rest. Yeah, I am, I am garbage. I know it. It's, it's who I am. It's what I am. I, I can cope with that. Uh, control versus controlling. You know, I want to I control you. I don't want to be controlled by you. That's another way to control those negative things feelings, those negative emotions, self-dependence. I don't need you. I've got me. I'm not going to trust you. Everybody else violated my trust. I'm good. Uh, negativity, self-righteousness, judgmentalism, victim, victimizer. Oh, poor me. I'm, I'm hurt. Not victim blaming here, you understand, but there are people who, who derive their identity from being that victim, from being that martyr. 
and that's not a healthy self-structure. Um, caretaking. There's a difference between caregiving and caretaking. Caretaking is I do something for you because I get value from you telling me how good of a person I am for taking care of you. Caregiving is when I give to you because I love you, I care about you, I want you to thrive. Uh, family rule, uh, family rules, martyr versus hero, we kind of talked about that, perfectionism, self-sabotage. You guys ever make plans and then you wake up the next morning and you don't do them? I was going to wake work out with uh, Pastor Gregory on Friday and I, I self-sabotaged and did not show up. That happens sometimes, self-sabotage. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do this, but I'm going to keep subverting that so it doesn't happen. Performance orientation, fear of rejection and abandonment, that's a huge one. Codependency, my value comes from what you think about me. And then of course addictions. These are self-structures that we build to protect ourselves from those thoughts. And this leads back to the family system again, and the process continues all over. So how do we break the family system? Each individual tries to find a partner to meet their needs, finds out that their partner can't fully meet those needs or heal their wounds. They turn to addictions, unhealthy behaviors to cope, and the cycle continues. How many of you tried to marry Jesus and were disappointed when you found out you didn't marry Jesus? Don't raise your hands that's something that happens to every person. Well, it's the term we use, the honeymoon is over, right? That's the term that we sometimes use in relation to that. Um, and, and friends, we need to recognize that no person is perfect. We all have these cycles of dysfunction. We're not going to escape it this side of eternity. Um, and so we have to recognize that when we look for partners, um, what, one principle from counseling from Dr. Dr. Sidlachek's, the Dr. Sidlachek's that I learned was um, we seek out people who are of a similar level of mental health as we are. So if you're like, oh, why are all men scum? Well, first off, that's a shaming thing. Uh, second off is we might want to evaluate our own systems of family. Um, uh, well, once again, I'm not victim blaming here. But what is it that, that we're seeking for? What is it that we're hoping a, a potential partner could meet in us? Um, and is it fair uh, as an expectation? Are, are we asking them to fulfill a role that only God can? Um, anyway, this isn't a premarital counseling class, but something to think about in this concept of the cycle of um, dysfunction. Let's go to the next slide. You know, it's important that we be kind to ourselves. You know, that idea of kindness to ourselves is so important. Um, David Sidlachek, Dr. David Sidlachek was a firefighter. And this story never happened to him, but it did happen to him that many times he'd go and, and put out fires and sometimes they'd have to go into the building and look for people. If a firefighter goes up into a building that is burning down and gets stuck and can't get out, and finds a window and he takes his axe and he breaks that window open and he finds himself on the third floor of that building and he decides that his only way to survive is to jump out of that window so he jumps out of that window and he survives but he breaks both of his legs in doing so did, did that firefighter break a law well, well, not really, but in a manner of speaking, yes, kind of, the law of gravity, right? He, he tried to do something, and the law of gravity um, being what it is, um, he, he hit terminal velocity, broke his legs. Did he have a choice? No, not if he wanted to survive. He jumped out of that window because he wanted to survive. But he broke something, some damaging effect happened to him because he was trying to survive. Often for us in families, we feel that trappedness. We feel stuck. We feel like we can't get out. And so we turn to addictions. We turn to drugs. We turn to sex. We turn to work or religion or anything that we could form an addiction or a struggle or a, a structure with. And we use it to survive. We use it to survive. But it will cause brokenness to happen to us. 
This isn't God punishing us, but it's the natural cause and effect of what happens when we try to break out of a three-story window. Now, now what if this same firefighter finds a three-year-old little girl on the top floor and rescues her, but same scenario, can't get out, there's only the window. So he throws her out of that window. She could potentially get very hurt as well, and it's not something she has any say over, but she still is going to get damaged in the process. Friends, this is why God hates sin. God doesn't hate sin because he has a list of pet peeves. God hates sin because it hurts people. It hurts us, and we do these things so we can survive. And, and I believe that God is gracious to us in those moments. I don't believe that God looks with condemnation and judgment because of the broken things that we do to survive. But God calls us, just like our scripture reading there in Malachi, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, because God wants healing. God's tired of seeing broken lives perpetuated over and over again. Ellen White says this in Ministry of Healing, very interesting. Among the victims of um, intemperance are men, this is basically drinking too much, um, so an addiction, are men and women of all classes and professions, men of high station, of emanation, uh, eminent talents, of great attainments, have yielded to the indulgences of appetite until they are helpless to resist temptation. Some of them who were once in the possession of wealth are without home, without friends, in suffering, misery, disease, and degradation. They have lost their self-control. Unless a helping hand is held out to them, they will sink lower and lower. With these, self-indulgence indulgence is not only a moral sin, so yes, it's a sin, but it's a physical disease. And so, friends, this is an attempt to be kind to ourselves. We have physical diseases, mental diseases, mental things that we're trying to cope with. And we must be kind to ourselves because if we're not, then Satan's going to perpetuate that, that system of shame in our hearts that's going to lead us to it more and more. So what's the solution to this? The solution is breaking the cycle. And how do we do that? We'll go to the next slide. Thank you so much. Oh, one more. <laughs> Thank you. Biblical intervention. You know, oftentimes people who have these systems have tried. They've tried reading the Bible. They've read the whole thing through. They've read, they've just read and read and prayed and prayed and nothing. And friends, that is a hard place to be. It's a place that I've been. But I will say that God is true to his promises. Uh, we need to follow these steps. The first step is to recognize your need. Recognize, hey, I've got a problem here. I'm out of control. I'm jumping out of windows trying to escape from this fire, and I see the damage that it's causing me. No, number two is self-reflective process. We need to ask ourselves, where is this coming from? What feelings? This is so hard, by the way, friends. To get rid of that, we have to face our fear. And who wants to face their fear? We have to do it, though. We have to have a self-reflective process. Maybe you need to have a counselor help you out, or a pastor, or a trusted friend, or, or a trusted um, person who, who loves Jesus. Um, to listen to your, your situation, um, to figure out what emotions am I feeling, what messages, what values do I believe about myself. The third one is death to self and a new identity in Christ. And what that looks like is saying, Jesus, I'm tired of being the suffering sacrifice in my own life. I need you to take that responsibility. Number four is healing through a safe community. Notice I said safe. I hate to say it, but many times churches are not safe places. I don't know anything about this church, but I'm going to assume this is a safe place. I know many people here who are safe people. Some of you I don't know as well, but I, I'm assuming this is a safe place. But finding a safe community, seeking out people that you trust, beginning that process of looking for people that you can communicate with. You know, they, they did a study on rats, and they, they gave rats a, a, a continual connection to drugs, to um, uh, heroin, I, I'm correct. 
uh, that they could access heroin whenever they wanted, and they found that, that rats who had strong community bonds did not seek the heroin as much as the rats who didn't have those community bonds. Humans and rats are obviously not a one-on-one -on -one comparison, but we're built for community, and when we have that community, that can give us victory. I'll be honest with you, my history is that I'm a recovering porn addict. That was something that I faced. That was my structure in life. Many people hate when we say that, but did you know that statistically 90% of young men in the Christian faith are porn addicts? It's a staggering statistic, and it's growing faster and faster. It's huge. Um, sorry, 90% in, in, um, in, in, not in the church are, are addicted to porn. 80% in the church are. It's still huge. It's absolutely huge. And if we don't talk about this, it's going to overtake us. And we might not like talking about it because we don't know what to do with it, but we must talk about it because we're experiencing genocide in our, our communities through this. Sexual genocide, brokenness on levels that, that we're not seeing, people not finding true, true love and safety in relationship. So um, healing and safe community, part of my story is finding a safe community. Um, if someone here is struggling with, with sex addiction, I'd highly recommend um, a, the Conquer Series group. You can find them online. It's, it's a free group. They have groups for both men and women because women can be, be sex addicts as well. Um, I would strongly encourage you to find a safe community like that. It's super healing, super helpful. Um, if you're feel like overeating is your issue. There's Overeating Anonymous. There's all kinds of things. There's codependence. There's Al-Anon. So many different groups that we should seek to be a part of to find healing. And the fifth one is building love and trust in God and others. Friends, you can't earn trust by saying, trust me. Did you know that? You can't earn trust by saying, trust me. You can only earn trust through experience. And so you might say, God, I don't trust you but I want to give you a chance. Try God. Moving into love and trust is what breaks the cycle. That's what breaks the cycle of dysfunction, is finding healing in safe communities and also in God himself through his word. Let's go to the last slide, and this is the end of the sermon. I would highly recommend to you to go to the Bible or go to online and look for, for online Bible promises and look for promises that directly relate to your circumstance as a person. My story is that my parents got a divorce and that was incredibly difficult. I don't think I had the, most har the hardest childhood ever, but it was very hard for me and I had no other frame of reference. And one of the things that I did was I tried to hurt myself because I believed if I hurt myself, my parents would get back together. And I believed that I was the problem. And a scripture that I found incredibly helpful in my trauma was Psalm 2710. Now listen to this. It says this, when your father and your mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. Isn't that encouraging? That's encouraging to my heart. And maybe there are other hurt little boys and girls in our, in our minds and our hearts that are there as well. I, I want you to embrace that truth because the, the devil and your own mind will scream at you and say, that's not true. You are a piece of garbage. But God is the one who has final authority. He's the one who has the truth. And he says that when you're forsaken, he will never forsake you. In fact, he will lift you up. So friends, go to scripture, find safe communities, seek them out, seek them through prayer, seek them with, with much boundaries, but seek them out because God doesn't want you to continue to hurt. He wants you to find freedom and healing from the destruction in your family history. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, we're so thankful that you came to this earth. And we're so thankful that, God, you are a healthy family. When, when Jesus was baptized, you said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Father, I know that there are many people in this church today, perhaps, 
that when they're thinking about their experience, they don't feel like anyone would look at them and say, well, uh, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. So, Father, breathe life into our hearts. Breathe your truth. Father, we pr I pray that you would find victory um, in each and every one of the lives here today over shame, over self-condemnation, and that you would give us a new identity, an identity found in the fact that we are your children and we have been adopted while we were sinners, while we were in the worst place that we could have possibly been. You died for us because you said that we are worthy. We thank you for this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.